Right, allow me to introduce our panelists who are already here in the studio to take us through, of course, that particular story from the Capital Markets Authority and looking at the political scenario in the country and how this interfaces with the business community. How is it affecting also the investors in this country? We just saw there the, the acting interior cabinet secretary, Ministry of Interior, with the diplomatic corps and urging them not to issue travel advisories so far. Right? Are they sensing any bugbears and fears as we're heading towards the general election? If you're just joining us this morning, I'd introduce to you or earlier to our viewers, our guest this morning. We have with us Vimal Shah, who is the chair of Kenya Daima and also the CEO of Bitco Africa Limited. We have also with us Dr. Chris Kirubi, who is an entrepreneur, also is an industrialist and a philanthropist. We have with us also Patrick Bath, who is managing partner. Uh, Adam Smith International. Good morning, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you very much. Uh, just looking at uh, what projections we had from the Capital Markets Authority so far, people were thinking maybe it's going to go the reverse as we're heading towards the general election. But it seems we have an upward trajectory. Is it now people are more confident that even as we're going towards general election, we will be, of course, having peace in the country and the bugbears and fears about, you know, maybe chaos happening during the, the elections won't, won't be, be there. Let's start with, with you, Fimal, because also you've been pushing the agenda <coughs> of Kagua, Kabla, Kuchua. Chagua Kabla, Kagua Kabla Kuchagua. Kagua. Right. Thank you. Good morning. I think um, when we look at from from stock market, when we look at from attractiveness of of, of Kenya as a reach in the region or in Africa, <laughs> and when you look at it from an economic perspective, um, this year has been unusual because we haven't had a serious dip as we have in in the past. And I think this is a good sign. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two. I think. People are more confident that the economic pillar of the country is still destined. Whether there's a change in government or the same government continues, the, the, the confidence about Vision 2030 and going forward yes. is going to continue. And I think all the manifestos, if you see them all, they're all aligned towards progress in the country. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is still a lot more investor confidence. There's still a lot more confidence in where we're going as a country. Mm -hmm. All right, but also looking at the past economic surveys that shows there, there, there has been polarizing and violent nature of Kenyan election politics and uncertainty about the outcome are among the root causes of economic slowdown. So if we project also, uh, we go back to 2013, we go back to 2007, how have you been also, as Kenya Daima, have you compared these uh, trajections and how they have been also you know, maybe upward or going downwards? So I think this year we've been hit with a drought. And I think that was a big yeah. issue. The drought has affected us in a big way in terms of agriculture production. And that's a major portion of our economy. Um, at the same time, I think construction has slowed down recently because there's a lot of projects uh, that are being planned. There's a lot of urbanization happening. But <clears throat> I think private investors probably have slowed down to say, fine, we shall begin a new project uh, you know, after elections. That's, that's something that's, that's happened. So that industry is there. That's so, some sectors there. But if you look at the transport logistics, if you look at uh, what's happening in terms of um, petroleum, goods, people are traveling, there's a lot more there. So demand is still continuing. People are st still eating. People are still consuming. The only question is, how is that being fed? Is it being fed through imports or is it fed through local manufacturing? The second question is, um, when we look at overall, the regional economy, and our trade with Tanzania, our trade with Uganda or neighboring markets, East Africa, that's gone down quite, quite a bit. I think that's an issue that we've been tackling. I think last week it was tackled with the Tanzanians. So we need to make sure that our exports improve there. Agriculture production and agribusiness mm -hmm. needs to be really picking up. I think it's more of uh, water management. Mm -hmm. All right, let's come to you, uh, Dr. Chris Kirubi, because also we, we have the benefit of hindsight with you. You've seen also successive uh, regimes so far. Uh, president Moy, you know, beginning also with uh, President uh, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, Mwai Kibaki as well. And from what you're learning and what you're seeing, because if you hack back to the unopposed president, the first general election in independent Kenya was held in December 1969, and Kenya also was a de facto one-party state, and after President Jomo Kenyatta banned the Kenya People's Union. And five months earlier, we also had a very, an, a, a, a very not really a conducive environment. The country had witnessed unrest following the assassination of uh, Cabinet Minister Tom Boyer, which many people blamed on the government. But despite the tumultuous event, it said the GDP grew around 8.0%, the same as the previous year. 
So it's not really about the outcome sometimes, it's about the confidence of, of the people or what is your projection? I, I, I personally, good morning anyway. Uh, I think the bi biggest problem in Kenya is that um, politicians do not feel responsible for economic uh, development. And when they go out there and uh, make claims and shout and cause a lot of uncertainty in the country, they do not feel responsible for because when you want to come to power as well, you must come to power in an economy that works. And therefore, I feel that uh, elections should be a happy moment for Kenyans to have an opportunity to elect the people they think can continue to lead the economy. And, and we cannot allow the economy to be a five-year term economy, mm -hmm. that we, we drop the economy by creating fear, by causing disharmony, disrupting trade, disrupting transport uh, of our goods, and also causing our neighbors lose confidence in us as a supply center. Th this to me is a very big thing that uh, we should put a contract with the politicians to say you can compete but continue to develop the confidence in the economy, in the country. Uh, in the past, the years you mentioned 1969 and all those years, mm -hmm. the economy was seen to grow in a bigger uh, chunk simply because it was coming from a very low base. Today, the economy has been growing and we know Kenya is one of the leading countries in Africa at 5% uh, of GDP. There are many countries hardly growing at 2% or 1%. So we need to protect the economy, whoever is coming to power. Economy should not be part of the politics. It should be part of the opportunity to grow. And uh, our neighborhood is very important for us. Uganda, Rwanda, South Sudan, Tanzania, and beyond. These are countries we have imports, partnership, they rely on us for a lot of goods and, 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 and including the seaport using our port to import their goods. But if we give them doubt that we are going to cause disharmony, if the reference is the last election, previous election, where their goods were stuck in the port and uh, transport was almost closed, it's going to hurt us. <laughs> and uh, therefore, we need, to, we need to encourage our young people to understand that they have no jobs because we create instability. They have no jobs because they are being used as fodder by politicians. What the scene we just seen there, people who are shouting and fighting and some being shot, should not be an image of Kenya. <laughs> it seems that we have devolved the violence from center to, to the counties. And I think uh, what the IBC must do is to hold those who are seeking elective posts to be responsible for the deeds of their, their members, their followers in the counties. And the only thing that can happen, they should be banned from taking part in the elections. Mm -hmm. And also the people who make unsubstantiated unsubstanti uh, claims, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making wild uh, claims that uh, rigging or all manner of things. I think we should not destroy the confidence of IEBC because it's the arbiter of the elections. So we should put our requirement, we should put things that are factual. And to be honest, I think uh, there should be a demand to respect that arbiter because otherwise we are advocating for chaos. Right, thank you. You mentioned also pledge, and I know also Kenya Daima has been on the phone front trying to make sure that these politicians, yes. they're, act, they're having a pact with the Kenyans 
uh, on, of course, observing the peace pledge as well. I don't know how yeah. that has really panned out. And do you think also they'll be responsible even with these pledges? Because it seems, yes, we can have contractual agreements, so to speak, with the Kenyans. But when it, when it comes to the crunch, mm -hmm. it's a different kettle of fish, Patrick Obath. I think this comes down to the personal responsibility of the political candidate, right? When I sign a pledge and I undertake that I shall do uh, behave in a certain way, not only with Kenya Daima, but being a citizen of Kenya and understanding that the constitution of Kenya also requires you to work in a particular way, mm -hmm. especially with the values that you eschew when you come towards political, you know, political office and any elective office, it then looks odd that you say one thing when you're sober and then you go onto a platform you and you change completely, right? And you know, all of a sudden, you're sort of, you're, you're inciting people and you're, you know, you want those people to wave at you. You want people to affirm things that makes you feel that you're on top of things. I think we really need to change the narrative as the people seeking public office to be behaving with decorum, to be really talking about issues. Mm -hmm so that people do not get incited by our own utterances at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And I think until the people who sign pledges and seek elective office under the constitution of Kenya recognize that they have a personal responsibility to the country to ensure that things are done in a peaceful manner, that they're objective in what they do, they don't incite people, um, then really the kind of scenes you've seen as, as Dr. Kirubi talked about in, um, <laughs> in Vasabit will happen. So I think really, it is up to us as individual people to recognize that we are the ones who cause those kind of things to happen. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the reality is that whenever, those, whenever there's a rally happening, people, we, and we, you know, we, we, we can say it openly, people are paid to come there. We know that, that happens. And once they're paid, it's, it's a renter crowd. Mm -hmm. So you bring them there to sort of rouse that tension so you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. There should be people who are coming there to listen to you about issues, and things that, that, you know, and policies and so forth. And I think Wananchi, uh, uh, you know, Mwenyenchi, as, as, as we now say they are, yeah. they should be the ones who are calling political rallies, not the people who are being, uh, who, who are campaigning. I should be the person to tell these people, please come and tell me what you, you, are, you know, what you're selling to me as an individual. And Kenyans should begin to think that when I'm going to a political rally, it's not because I've been invited by the, by the politician. Is because I want to go there and listen and be able to make an informed choice. Mm -hmm. And if we take that attitude to those kind of places, then I think we'll have a lot more decorum and, 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 um, uh, and peace within the, the electoral process. Mm -hmm. But also, as a business community, how have you been able also to have that particular interface with the politicians? Because I know they've written these manifestos. And I doubt, I highly doubt if any of you ha have been approached by these politicians and say, okay, as a business community, of course you desire us to, to, to see your business thriving in a very peaceful community and uh, country as well. But have you been approached? Did you also maybe engage uh, the politicians as Kenya Diamond say, we as a business community, this is what we want to see. Also, domicile in your manifestos and, of course, we will hold you accountable if you don't do it. Have they? I think uh, when we look at that perspective, um, when we talk about there's many bodies in private sector, KEPSA, and there's a lot of other organizations, they've already given out various documents that actually decide in terms of sector by sector, what policies we should be having. And of course, under Vision 2030, we have a very clear agenda of what progress we want to make in each area. That has been adopted by a lot of these um, you know, manifestos. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all borrowed from there. But then when we look at the economic pillar, the social pillar, and the political pillar, yes. I think political pillar is running it, it's quite well because the new constitutions come in. But the economic pillar, they're all aligned. If you look at all of them, they're all aligned. When you look at the leadership ethos that we need now, because now what it needs is, the vision is set, the, the, the agenda is set. We need to create jobs. We need to create more prosperity for our people. That's, that's across the board. The question is, who's going to lead that and who's going to be in the hot seat? Yes. It's not about what is going to be different. They're similar. The question is, who's going to lead it now? It needs leadership ethos in terms of transparency, mm -hmm. accountability. What I said, do I live up by that? The other key issue is, uh, transparency, accountability, and responsibility. Now, when you look at chapter six, talking about leadership and integrity, if people are true to themselves, what they promise pre-elections, why do we have these rallies only pre-elections? Yes. Why do they stop post-elections? 
Why not have one every week post election so that you actually go and put out your scorecard and say, this is what I achieved, this is what we did. It's all being done pre. My point is, that's where the problem lies right now. So accountability going forward should be said, you said this, is it, being, is it happening? The peace pledges that have been made by all the leaders, now I can say all the people who are in politics today have made peace pledges very clear. Let's hold them accountable to that, <laughs> that this will happen. So I can, I can think, I, th I think the most important thing is a lot of the talk when it comes to the gallery in the rallies has changed. It's not violent anymore. <laughs> Right? It's only right now, not, somebody's not talking about how I'm going to change things, yes. it's about how the, I'm better than the other guy. Mm -hmm. If that changes, first class. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, uh, it's not about Hakietu anymore by, by one inch. It's about Niwajibuetu. What's our responsibility? So, politicians are doing their job. They know best how to go and conduct rallies. But I think a lot of people see the same rally everywhere else. The key question is, what are the people looking for? Are we going to say we are responsible? So my duty as a Monainshi out there, I have a right to vote because the vote is very secret, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows where I'm going to vote. So let's keep that secret. That's fine. But at the end, vote for what you think is right and where the issues are being discussed. Mm -hmm. The minute issues are being discussed of what progress, what's going to happen and how I'm going to do things. If it's the price of Unga, if it's this, give me a formula of how it's going to go down. Give me a formula of how I'm going to create jobs. If I'm promising six million jobs, Exactly what am I going to do? The, where am I going to do it? Yes. That's where we got to hold them accountable. But then later on, what happens a lot of times, and we've seen in the past, excuses come up that, oh, I wanted to do this, but this, this stopped us, this stopped us. I would rather say the leadership ethos we need, no excuses. Get on with it, let's get it out there. Because I think the youth of Kenya now want it. They want to see, I need what you said, I want it done. Right. I like the idea where you say that we can, we can actually carry out a post election, you know, review of how it has been, mm -hmm. uh, we putting these people to accountability, but yeah. whose onus is it? Because it seems after the elections, everything will just taper off, uh, Kenyans will go back to their lives, and the leadership will carry on with the day. But we have 100 days also, maybe in, with, the, with the mature uh, de democracies, and they come after 100 days and say, how has it, has it fared? Donald Trump, yeah, with the Trumponomics, how is it affecting our business community? Has he implemented all the things that he pledged that he will do uh, during the campaigning period? So is it the owners also of the Kenyans themselves, or who will take the initiative? Is it the business community that will come and say, okay, uh, President so-and-so, you've taken office, it's been 100 days, you said within 100 days you're going to infect this particular uh, policy or that particular uh, regulation, but we cannot see it happening. What is happening right now? I think every one of us, if I would say it that way, mm -hmm. every one of us, including media, including people, and it's devolved. Like, like you said right now, mm -hmm. we've devolved it. So even at county level, even at MCA level, what they've promised, let's make sure they live up to it. That's but how responsible. And I think that's the tipping one, because everyone is thinking is every one of us. So I wait for you know, the business community to start, then the business community is waiting for the media to start, the media is waiting for the civil society to start, and then we're just no, stuck we, in a rut. We will not stop, but I'm just saying, <clears throat> We, as business community, we will we keep at it. The, the media needs to pick it up. Put a KPI every day, key performance indicator of everyone. Promise made, what's the reality? You know, put that judgment on, on, on your papers every day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Let's I, I, I think we need to create a very strong partnership between yeah. the media and the private sector and capture everything promised by different groups, different parties, to make sure that... Um, what any group promises mm. is captured and then to make sure that uh, at the end of it whoever is allowed to to participate in leading the, the country we hold them accountable and i think this the, the media for which i'm one of those who own a media house can support the business community we need to create a body not these people who give the, the elections, uh, who is more popular and who is not more popular. We need to go on and create a body that manages to see what deliverables have been delivered. Mm -hmm. And if the politicians know that we hold them to account for what they have delivered, I, I think they will start being more serious. I, I, I think we need to lead so that the rest of the masses can learn those promises have they been delivered. Scorecard. Uh, the scorecard, we, we, we do need to deliver 
what we promise. We need no longer to play with the emotions of the, 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 the supporters. And, and if we do that, and I think Americans do this, we, we, we need to hold them accountable. Have you delivered? Mm -hmm. Have you created jobs? I, I, I'm looking like the, the changes the government is creating, the, 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 the development, the changes up to the eighth grade, mm -hmm. should be continued up to university level. I think we have an opportunity now to change the kind of education we want to give to our students. Why the technical schools? Who is creating the people Bitcoin will require for their development? And, and they need to sit with us, we, the private sector, and say, what do you need? Which part of the economy you want to develop? How can we develop trainees together so that these people can create jobs. So when we have contracts with the Chinese, with the Germans, with the British, they don't have to bring any people here. We train the people for them. Who is responsible for that? And, 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 and this, to me, is an area that private sector can participate in partnership with the government. As far as uh, the politicians are concerned, mm -hmm. they only see us as a source of money they call me just to ask me, can you give me money for election? They don't ask me what my policy that I'm going to advocate mm -hmm. is going to support your development, is going to support your agenda. They, they just ask for money, 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 money. You know, we paid money until we have no more money, but are the policies supporting for me to make more money? Mm -hmm. I, I, I doubt when people shout and cause a scare in the investment in the, in the economy. Mm -hmm. Right. I think I'll, I'll weigh in here and just, I think, be very specific. Yeah. Who delivers on election promises? Yeah. There are two people. One is the president, which is the executive, heads the executive in the country, and the other one is the governor, who heads the executive at the county level. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think there's, we need to sort of ride on what KEPSA has done in terms of having different um, engagement platforms that takes on the individual ministers who are eventually the people who are executing their promises and then take on the president at given time. So there is a whole framework that happens there. Perhaps that needs to be sort of um, elevated to one that is participatory across a, a larger number of bodies. Mm -hmm. So you have like a super, a super presidential round table whereby every uh, you know, different um, stakeholders, stakeholders are, yeah. are put in, right? Mm -hmm. But that also needs to be created at the county level, mm -hmm. right? And at the county level, which is the business community body that is strongest? We have an organization called the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce. There is a chamber in every single county in this country. Mm -hmm. And they should actually rise up and put mechanisms that, as a business community, they should call other people and hold governors accountable. Because they're the ones who have got to deliver to an inch at that level. So I think that there is a lot of opportunity to create mechanisms that will hold people accountable. And there's only those two levels. The members of parliament and the members of the county assembly, yeah. they are purely um, legislative bodies that also hold accountability mm -hmm. in a certain manner. Mm -hmm. But for the Wananchi, we need to have direct platforms that interrogate the governor and interrogate the president and his team, Right? And, and their individual teams, the county executives, on their deliverables that they promised during elections. Well, maybe just as a writer also to your comment, because I remember with uh, the NAC coalition, we had uh, the efficiency delivery unit that was yeah. domiciled in the ministry of, uh, uh, actually, in, in the office of the prime minister. But we don't know what really happened with the efficiency d delivery unit. Maybe as also uh, Dr. Chris Kirubi is saying, we, we should have a sort of a body. Yes. Maybe that efficiency delivery unit is standing just... You know, as a standalone, uh, as a standalone organization, yeah. which really tracks, you know, the deliverables of, of these uh, leaders that we are actually choosing. There I, may be a need to sort of expand the role of the, of the ombudsman. I think it needs to be an independent body that actually looks at, at at that kind of thing. Because if it's domiciled within the delivery, the executive itself, yes, right. How independent is it? Right? And is it going to be objective in terms of what they do? That's what I'm saying. Right? Why, why can't we just uncouple it from uh, you know, the offices and become an independent, independent body itself? Yeah. I, 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 I think, if I can say, we, we do need 
supported even by government itself, a, a body that uh, encompasses private sector and the Wanaichi themselves, so that we can hold the governors who lead the county government is where we need to focus on. You know, if we focus on every county deliverables, mm -hmm. there are 47 counties make a total of the nation. When we talk about food shortage, we keep talking about government. Government does not farm. Government owns no land. The land is under counties. And we should go to each counties and say, what is your responsibilities in feeding your people? Mm -hmm. What did you do to save water? What did you do to save forests so that your county contributes to the welfare of the economy, of the nation? We keep on talking about government. Government owns no land. The land is owned by counties. By the way, I'm very proud for what government has done to get these barons that have had grabbed government, the county land. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about it. Yes. What is Mr. Mudavadi talking about the land he had grabbed? What is Joe Nyaga talking about the land that the they had oh, uh, <laughs> grabbed? Mm -hmm. So we, I think everybody must be held accountable, not on party line, but on individual line. What is your role in grabbing the land as an individual, in also holding governors to account for what production have you helped to grow your, 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 your county? I, I think if we can go that route, rather than talking an amorphous government, I think it will produce future results because if governor knows he will be accountable to what he has done to feed the people, to exploit the land he rules, mm -hmm. I think we'll start changing this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that than just saying govern, government, 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 which government? Who owns the land? The Nazis are striking today. Yes. But who is going to the counties and asking the governors, why are the nurses in your county striking? Where is your role in making sure you manage agreements with the, with the nurses mm -hmm. in order to have your hospitals working? Okay. I, I think we devolved a lot of responsibilities but the people and the media is not focusing in that responsibility, who is responsible for doing what. Where are the governors called to account? I have not seen it. Mm -hmm. I have right. not seen Nairobi as putting Kidero to account for why do we have cholera? Why don't we have water? He should tell us if it, who owns the water deliverables to the people of Nairobi, and by the way, it's clean water. When you allow boozers which carry rubbish to also carry water for drinking for people, who gives them license? This, these are the kind of things we need to go down to, to drill down to who is responsible for what. And I think the media houses need to have very good experts in uh, analyzing and following things mm -hmm. without favors, without trying to be in, in anybody's uh, shoes. I challenged the media the other day, we got to remain neutral and uh, go and drill the real issues. If we can deliver that, I think this country's governance will start changing. And the media has a very big role to expose these issues and, and not to have all these uh, numbers dropped on us that make no sense. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Let, let's just circle back with you, Vimal Shah, because um, we know you've been holding this particular forums 
peace pledges so far we have 184 peace pledges that have been of course made now 355 355 mm -hmm. no what okay maybe this is an update mm -hmm. of where <laughs> 355 that is more yeah would you tell us who are among these people who have signed these peace pledges 355 of them i think it starts first with the president of kenya all right uhuru kenyatta it's also started with the leader of opposition uh, honorable uh, raila odinga they've all signed the governors have all signed the senators have signed, the MPs, the parliament have signed, so a lot of corporates have signed, and I think even the, 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 the Chief Justice has signed, so the judiciary has also signed, mm. the, 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 the legislature has signed, and therefore also the executive have signed. Um, the, the police, IG police, have also signed. So they've all pledged to peace and making sure that they will not be part of incitement. Why is this important? I think the important thing is that when so many people have committed themselves publicly, and those are documents we have with their signatures, we can hold them accountable. And that's what we talked about earlier. Accountability, transparency, and the leadership ethos <laughs> of holding responsible, people responsible. When you get authority in any government or any, any place, whether it's governor or any place, you get authority and you get responsibility. The authority comes with responsibility. Yes. You cannot abdicate responsibility to your juniors and say, because of them, I have suffered. So it stopped, the buck stops with them. And I think this is where it's crucial to say, everybody has pledged to this. If everybody has already said this, then why are we as Kenyans, whereas as investors, as Monainchi, as anybody else, why are we worried that, oh, you know, things could go wrong? And that's why the predictions, the predictions are coming out from historic uh, occurrences. Mm -hmm. Okay, it happened in the last election, whatever. All the analysis is backward looking. I would rather say forward looking is what is required now. And look at it from investors right now. If all investors did not stop, did not slow down and said, fine, come what may. So what's going to change come August 9th? Mm -hmm. you, must have, you might just have new leaders. You might have, you might have new leadership. Every governor, every MCA, you will going to have different people, right? The key issue is that they continue with the, with the progress that the country needs to make in every county, in, every, in the national government. There's only two arms, right? Mm -hmm. It's national government and county government. Yes. So the key areas there, like, like Patrick said, is the governors are responsible and the president are responsible at the top. Now, these are the two key areas who say, fine, we'll make things happen. If that happens, then why would private sector or even investors or even Monainchi mm -hmm. stop progress in terms of building that house that you wanted, occupying the stuff that you wanted, getting that loan and really looking at jobs, and creating more jobs. Consumption is still continuing. Mm -hmm. Real, realize that we have 45 to 50 million people now in Kenya. Consumption is still happening, education is still happening, healthcare is still required, everybody still needs to work. We need to be creating more and more jobs, either through entrepreneurship, to, to empower people to start their own businesses, or by getting employment. So when we look at this, Everybody's aims and objects are the same. Mm -hmm. Every Kenyan, I said this so many times in our in Kenya Daima, is every Kenyan is peaceful by nature. I mean, Kenyans are peaceful by nature. They don't want fracas. They don't want any problems, right? Mm -hmm. Then why does it happen that before elections, around elections, we start getting intimidated by 14,500 people who are standing for elections to say, incite people in this manner or that manner? If we stand up and say, this election is going to be the most peaceful election ever, as Kenyans, as all Kenyans, mm -hmm. And we don't let people sort of fool us around. I'm sure we have no problems. We will actually defeat these whole, um, you know, pro pro forecasts. Mm -hmm. We can change. We can change history right now. Mm -hmm. All right, true. Uh, you mentioned leadership uh, ethos. You mentioned also accountability. Yes. Uh, a forum that we also maybe, uh, as media has tried to create for accountability, was the presidential debate. We saw yes. the running mates also didn't turn up. Only one did. And of course, last time also, Monday, we saw the president uh, not showing up. He was a no-show for that particular uh, presidential debate. Of course, yeah, it is the onus of a president to choose whether he wants to come or not. But at the end of the day, as, as Kenyans, we expect that, yes, come and tell us, this is your manifesto and how you're going to execute what you've actually uh, put on your manifesto. We, we probe you, we ask questions. How can we compare your current manifesto with your previous manifesto where you never delivered? We have questions, we need answers. You, know, you don't show up. Yeah. So where is a, is, a, is a place of accountability? Let's hear from uh, Dr. Chris. What was your reaction when the, the president was a no-show for the debate? You know, you, <coughs> you know there's, there's one, one issue in this country that um, we try during elections to bring the, the leadership to a level of those who are seeking jobs. 
I think the president has been with us as the ruling person responsible for this nation. I think we need to look at a different forum where we sit with the president and also where we sit with governors who run the country for the last five years and go through what has the county performed, what has the national government performed, rather than this hype of few questions, one hour, asking the country, what has the country done? And bring them to the same equal with guys who have had no responsibility, but promises. We got to define what the country achieved and get a platform, clear platform, a bringing on board what has the country performed, what was the promises in five years, what have you done? And we cannot bring down the president to a level of people who are looking for jobs. For me, I think the media misdirected how to get deliverables. We need not to hype an event. We need to get the government to deliver, to promise the promises they did, what have they achieved, what have they not achieved, and why. And this cannot be a one-hour affair. As far as I'm concerned, the president of a nation must be held accountable properly by analyzing what has been achieved, what was promised to be achieved. And then, really, that to me is the way we should be doing it. And then these people who are looking for jobs, we ask them, what are their policies? What are they going to deliver? So what, what, what will that forum be then? If, uh, I, I, if, if, I think yeah. there should be different forums where the president and the government shows what they have delivered. But the media is just coming into play because it seems there is a vacuum, right? Who really holds them accountable? Right? They That's just come, they'll tell us this is 100 days, this, is, this has been our score, but there is no probing at all that is done. Maybe we should have a business circle with a faith-based organization, the civil society. You know, there's a roundtable circle that will come and question the president and all the ministers and the governors on the deliverables. One, one person, Deba, is the one who has had a role to deliver. Let us sit with him and see what they promised, what government promised, what has government achieved. And equally, in job creation, I think we'll get better results. But mixing the president and the guy who has had no role just promises, the guy promising can say anything. How do you account for him? to deliver. It's the next five years if he ever gets position of power. But the president and the government and the governors have the role, they Thank have you. managed the economy Thank you. for the last five years. Mm -hmm. We need to deliver, we need deliverables and we need promises as two different issues. All right, thank you. To, me, it... to me, I think uh, it's easy to promise. All right. So it's, for, for it's, me, your estimation, yeah. this forum was not uh, a good forum it, for it the president? It was not. For, oh, if, I, if I'm the ruling president, I would not attend. I would want a position to deliver what I have achieved against my manifesto. Thank you. All right, let, let's hear from Patrick. I think we, we had a discussion uh, in, in the break, actually, about yeah. that, that the need to have a regular um, situation whereby the governors and the president tell us what they're delivering, yes. right? So every quarter, every year, there is a forum which 
basically looks at their progress on delivery against a set of promises. Yes. Their manifesto or what has been agreed. And that is basically charted over five years, right? Then that should then be put to a stop when it comes to electioneering. Yes. Electioneering is about, we, this has been achieved, we know that, we've talked about it, it's been done. The presidential debates should be very clear, and there should be a very clear agenda that is not talking about the past. It's talking about the manifestos and which you're going to do in the future. So that the moderators and the people who run that presidential debate and the people coming into the presidential debate have very clear rules yeah. that says we are not going to talk about the past. Yes. We are not going to talk about that because we already have a system that has documented that, and that's history. We are now talking about what are you talking about for the future? Yes. But the Why should I elect you for the future? Because you are now telling me you've got a manifesto. Yes. You've got this, you're promising that, right? Let's talk about how you're going to do it. Interrogate their mm. ability to do it interrogate not just that but interrogate how are they going to lead the country and so forth so let's have a much more focused discussion looking forward at the presidential debate because you're talking about me electing that person for the future not for the past well right? I, don't, I don't seem so to agree I, with you i, 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 I think point, it's, it's two different things because if yeah. we have the current president for instance yeah. there, and we have his previous manifesto yeah. and we have a newsletter of manifesto is it just fair to actually probe and compare this particular manifesto with the previous manifesto? Is yeah. this a cookie cut of just the previous manifesto that we have with the current manifesto? There is a way that the, the, the history has a bearing to the current as well. So we cannot actually just poop with the idea, yes. I, you, I fully agree with you because you're, you're interrogating manifestos, not performance. Yes. Right? And that's a clear thing. It's got to be about my manifesto Polic and Policy. the previous manifesto. Policy. Is it the same manifesto as I had before? Yes. Why is my manifesto saying I'm going to do this, yes. which I said in the last manifesto? What has happened in between? So I think it's got to be about manifestos, not about performance yes. during, during that. So I, I think there's, there needs to be a slight, um, a, a, a slight um, tweaking of the way it is conducted. But can, I, can I just add yeah, that? Yes, please. I think, I think the key issue is the institution of the debates is an important institution. That's been created now, and I think I would say very well done to the medias for actually having that going on, despite non-attendance by the first time, second time, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think keeping it on was important. Mm -hmm. Going forward, this should be institutionalized every time. Yes. Nothing wrong with that. However, what we're talking right now is about the format of how we're going to change it and forward-looking. Yes. That's all that needs to be tweaked. But So you don't put somebody who's been there on the carpet mm -hmm. you know, for five years. However, what we've talked about is that this should be the same thing that happens every quarter. Every quarter, every quarter from now on going forward. Every quarter have that available there, not only president, but also the governors. Yes. And have them there. Yesterday you had the NMG investors briefing. Yes. What was that for? What was the objective? What was the purpose? The purpose was to show where we've come, where are we going, and what's forward looking. Right? And therefore, what happens to the investors? Investors get calm to say, fine, ah, now I can invest in this company or I realize what it is. Mm. In the same manner, why can't we get the president quarterly and the governors quarterly? That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. If you get that done, it's not a debate, it's more about scorecards, right? Yes. And you will get more, more progress going forward. However, coming to when people are looking for a job, mm -hmm. everybody who's standing for elections is actually looking for a job, either governor, mm -hmm. MCA, mm -hmm. or, 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 or president. They're all looking for jobs. So it is the right thing to do. The debates are the right thing to do. However, it should be more forward-looking to say, fine, what am I going to do in the next five years? Therefore, elect me. So do you agree with the position being espoused also by Patrick and uh, Chris, or first of all, that we should have no bearing of the history? No, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah. What I'm saying to you is, is different. The, the quarterly reports, I the quarterly it. ones would give you the history. Okay. So history is already known because yeah. somebody who's incumbent already there, yeah. all the governors, and I'm saying all the governors, all the guys who are in, 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 in power would have a history anyway. And that should be known. Right now the point is it's not known yes. and we're all trying bitching about it. I think we should be more know about it, know the scorecard and therefore we've realized. And also in that you can discuss what worked, what didn't work mm -hmm. and what will work now. And going forward, what are we going to tweak? Yes. So therefore people can then take a decision, do I continue or do I, do I want to change? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's up to the people to decide. Right. But I don't want to be judgmental on what happened, what didn't happen. However, the institution that has been created 
continue with it, improve it. All right, but why is it that also the business community wait for someone else's or voice to be heard other than yours to be heard? When we have the cases of cholera, or well, every one of you is milling out, yeah? You'll come and say we're waiting for maybe the, the, the public uh, health uh, director to come to the fore and say well, why this is happening. When we have the maize, uh, you know, issue with maize flour, and I think also you get adversely affected because also you are dependent uh, so much as a material. The corn, the corn uh, oil that we have from Bitco, largely also come from. from so, from so I think I think the key issue is there's a lot of dialogue that happens, which is not on the public. We don't go and talk to the media. We don't go and talk to the to the press and say, yeah, here's my issue or whatever. It's all done through dialogue. And when there's government, when there's national government, county governments, even your MCS, you have that dialogue and you're engaging with them all the time. You don't want to talk to them through the media. Do you get it? Yeah. So there's a lot of that happening all along. And we have monthly uh, MSFs that we meet up with all these people and really sector-wise issues are being discussed with every ministry. It's already happening. My point is, that's not for public use because it's not made public. Mm -hmm. However, on issues, you don't want to be judgmental. Oh, this happened. Now you go and blame and say, fine, let's go out and say, say things against them. I think the key issue is, what can we do to improve it? What was the thing that went wrong? And that's where the dialogue happens. Mm -hmm. Right. Dr. Chris. I, 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 I think what we need is a partnership between the media, the owners of business, who are the investors, and representatives of the working groups so that we all sit together and see how and uh, what policies are being done affecting the future growth of the economy. The, the workers are stakeholders. They know if I don't do well, I will dismiss them, I sack them. So they have a stake to make sure my company continues to do well. And this is where we have never brought them on board to understand how do they secure their jobs. With the farmers, how and what service is he getting and support from the governors and the policies in the ruling county to help them make investment in farming. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we need to create a body that really brings the investors, brings the media, brings the worker. We monitor on county by county level how do we grow opportunity for the workers. What is the impediment in expanding the economy? Because you look at the, the mining sector, mm -hmm. this country can be a very serious investor in mining. But who is managing it and how is it being managed? Where is the county? Where is the policy? Where is the workers? So that we all work together to create that mining level mm. but here we we blame we talk about issues but we don't drill down to who is responsible mm -hmm. which group of people work together with that mining opportunity to make sure that this economy grows mm -hmm. there is too much talk and too little investment being done too little accountability and and i think this is where we fail these people who are who want positions they're talking but if you go down to drill what they will do from the promise there is it's an empty shell mm -hmm. there's nothing in the government which has performed or had opportunity to perform we need to sit with them and say in this area what have we done? What have we missed to do? You, you know, if we can go to actual performance, and that's why for me, I will not put the president in the same group mm -hmm. as the guy who has had no opportunity to perform and he's leveled with the president. It's, it's not possible. 
the president, we should be asking him, what have you done? We drill down to the numbers, statistics. You know in America they talk about employment. Who has created, what number of people have you created in employment? With the governor, we go down, we say, what was your responsibility? You are in charge of creating jobs in your county, in developing agriculture in your county, in developing forest, afforestation in your county, in getting the water available to your people. What have you done? So if we can be specific in each area, rather than all this hula baloo mm -hmm. discussion, it, it doesn't make sense. We, we, we talk for politics. We talk for the headline in the newspaper, in the media. Really, this is what we talk about. But we need organizations that go down to factual development. Right, but, but also maybe I should also flip that to you. Yes. You as investors as well, you've, you've mentioned that they approach you, they want to be financed, right? Yes. So what metrics do you normally use, uh, Vimal, Patrick, also Dr. Chris, to, 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 to make sure that then this is a pol political candidate that I want to support as a business uh, uh, co community or as an investor? Because at the end of the day, the, we, we, we have also cop what they call a cop coptocracy. Right, where we have these people who have been captured by the, by, by the investors behind, you know, so they are the people who are actually running the show. So you have sort of a shadow, a shadow presidency, right? Yeah. You know, who's, he's just maybe a mere pawn in the game of chess. Let's hear from Patrick. Then you tell us, they've approached you. What really, uh, what really informs you now to actually support this particular candidate and leave the other? Patrick. I think that there are two levels of engagement. One is me as Patrick Obath as an individual yes. and the beliefs that I have and the, and the particular policies that I agree with, right? Yes. And that is personal and means that I can relate with Vimal who's standing for, you know, for governor of Nairobi or whatever it is. And he comes and we talk and I say, fine, I'll support you as Vimal because what you've brought to me is what I like. So that's the, the, the personal level, right? Yeah. Mm. Then you have the next level where you're looking at a sector or you're looking at a community of people who have together the need for a policy, the need for something else, right? So they're looking not just as an individual business, but they're looking at the, at, the, at the environment in which they want things to happen. That engagement is completely different, right? Because then you're not looking at what I want out of him mm -hmm. as, an, as a person. I'm looking at what environment do you want that person to create for me as a person in the business community. So that's when you then look at organizations like the Kenya Association of Manufacturers and so forth and so on, which develop what they require. Then you look at KEPSA, which then looks at, at the whole lot together. Those engagements take different forms. So when we engage as a business community, we engage at a macro level. And when I engage with Vimal, because he's standing for a particular, for a particular post, I tell him, okay, Vimal, I'm going to support you. Right? Because I believe in what you, you're going to do. So there I think when I, when I support Vimal or Chris when they're standing, is because I believe in the values that they eschew, the kind of promises they're making and so forth. So it's a much deeper um, support. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll find that the way we socialize um, politi political activities in Kenya compared to, say, the U.S. is quite different. If you go to the U.S., you find that a lot of the large corporates are actually politically aligned. Mm -hmm. They're aligned to this part, the Republicans or the whatever it is and so forth, and they put money into that election publicly. But here you will find that a lot of the businesses, right, will align with the environment, with the policies that are coming out through the associations that they have. In a lot of the other countries which are more de de developed democracies, mm -hmm. those associations actually have political leanings. They're not apolitical. Mm -hmm. But you tend to find that Given our circumstances in Kenya, organizations like the Kenya Private Sector Alliance and so forth cannot afford to be politically aligned. They have to be an association that basically will question whoever it is who is there. We will require deliverables from whether it is Royal Ain or is Uhuru who is there. We will approach them with the same, same question. All right. Because we are holding them to account on behalf of the business community. But now you're the, uh, under the ambit of the, uh, of the associations, you know, and uh, the sectors. Yes. But we're coming to an individual, like the man, or like, like Dr. Yeah. Chris, and you as, as an individual, yeah. not as an association. I, I, will, I will basically, as I said, I will look at 
does that person have the same value system as I have? Are they people of integrity? Are they people who show good leadership qualities and so forth? And do they have a promise that I align with? And once that is done, on a personal basis, that is who I will go for. And that is exactly what Mkenya Daima is saying. Kagua kabla ya kuchagua. And that Kagua process is a very personal thing. Mm -hmm. And I will then support who aligns with my expectations and values. Mm -hmm. and, if, and, and if a leader, the person who wants to come to me that I say vote for me or support me, is somebody whose integrity I doubt, somebody who I don't think will deliver, because from whatever, not just the manifestos that they come with, these people live a normal life. They have certain things they do, even whether they're in the opposition or whether they're in government. They do certain things in life on a daily basis. Those things will translate into the type of leadership they, they be, uh, leaders they become when they become leaders of the country. So it doesn't matter whether you've been, a, you've been in government or not. Those things will still come in. And that is where I select where I'm going to put my money. Mm -hmm. Right? So the issue of somebody standing on a platform and talking to me and telling me whatever it is, is not really what is going to determine it. I've had a much longer history of review of that person before I consider whether I'm going to support them. All right. Pivan. I think we've got to look at it from an angle where what are we looking for in leadership? What are we looking for in people? I mean, credibility is, is the most important thing. What is credibility? It's four things, right? It's integrity, that they say and they do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Number two is intent. Is the intent to really progress or the intent is self-realization? Uh, you know, uh, 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 or And then the third thing is competencies. Do they have the competencies to really manage and make things happen? And fourth thing is results. What have been the past results? And what do I expect as results? If any of these is zero, credibility is zero. Mm -hmm. So when you look at these angles, you say, fine, what is there? Second thing is, I think, pro-business in terms of creating jobs. Because Kenya's need number one is to create more and more jobs. Now, whether it's in the services sector or the manufacturing sector, which one is radical enough to say, we're going to create X number of jobs in the services sector and X number of jobs in manufacturing. Which one says that, right? Number two, which one sounds really responsible so that they're not, utterances are not cosmetic, you know, uh, to say, oh, I promise something and I never deliver. Then there's track record, right? In terms of what they've done. But today, there's a complete new disruption happening. Mm -hmm. Our youth are coming up and they completely uh, have no baggage. And I think that's where the future of Kenya is going. Mm -hmm. When you look at it going forward from here, we've got our youth that are amazing. The digital disruption we're having right now and, and where it's going to go. I'm sure the media has also got the same thing. Mm -hmm. But everybody else, if you're not in digital, you're going to be out. That really is going to be the future. Kenya's future is very bright. And I think ultimately, at the end of the day, as in Kenya, what Patrick said is clearly, as in Kenya Daima, we are totally neutral, not aligning with anybody. As Kepsa, not aligning with everybody. And we actually get influence, influential in discussing with everybody to align their mindsets towards thinking pro-jobs, pro-creating business, pro-creating pro more and more alignment. Now, when that happens, I can tell you that's a, probably a result of all the manifestos, even Vision 2030. Right? It's all come out in that direction and I think that's been bored. It's not a party thing. Vision 2030 is not one party or another party. Mm -hmm. It's a country thing. It's a national vision. Now, in that, next, by 2030, we'll have three more elections. Mm -hmm. Does it really matter who comes, who doesn't come? It won't matter because we've got three more elections to go for. The question is the metrics we set for ourselves, yes, yes. the progress we set for ourselves, we've mm -hmm. got to make that happen. Now, the question is execution on the ground because I can make promises. Now, execution is going to be key. Who's going to be delivering? Who's not going to be delivering? Number two, what are the institutions that are important? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got the judiciary, we've got the executive, and we've got the legislature, right? And our judiciary must start becoming far more better because you must have justice on time. You know, justice delayed is justice denied. denied yes. And this is something that seriously needs improvement. Mm -hmm. However, even if I come in as a president, mm -hmm. I cannot change the judiciary because that's independent now. You know that's independent, right? Yeah, yes. It's got its own ethos, and that's where we've got to make sure that that comes up. It's not about the leader next time. The same thing with, 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 with Parliament. The President is not in Parliament. So Parliament has to have credible leaders, so all the MPs we choose have to have a different mindset. This is why I'm saying it's not going to be about one leader or the second leader or a party. It's going to be about which person at every individual level. With devolution, I think the beauty of devolution is that now things have been devolved right to the grassroots. 
So if you check your MCA, how many people know what an MCA does? Mm -hmm. Do you really go to your MCA to get your, 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 your water and your, your yeah. road fixed? We need to do that. We all go in straight to the president or to yeah. the governor, yeah. right? It's the MCA who has to do that. Now, the question is this whole thing about a lot of money being spent on elections. You delay elections for three, four days, and they say, now we've spent all our money, what do we do the next month? Mm. The question that I, I talk about, Wajibu Etu, about Kenyans is, <sighs> people are taking a lot of money from anywhere because there are needs or whatever, but do not sell your loyalty. Sell your loyalty to people who are issue-based where the right thing is going to happen. Because a lot of people are dishing out money, expecting that if I give you money, you will vote for me. Mm -hmm. But Kenyans are smarter now. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not selling yeah, their loyalty. Yeah. They're actually saying, fine, give me what you've got, and then I'll, dis I'll decide. Yes. I think that's, that's probably a responsibility that Kenyans have. So overall, I would put it together and say, fine, really, let's check out the credibility, integrity, intent, competency, and results, and check those out and say, fine, who on what barometer comes out better. All right, thank you. I don't know, it's 7.30 on the nose, and Patrick and uh, Vimal yeah. also yeah. Were, hadn't uh, requested that they leave early because they got other engagements. So I don't know, uh, but uh, just... Indulge me two minutes, right? Because I think this is also important. With the uh, East Africa community integration that we've been trying to align over time, and also when we have new uh, rulership, Rwanda is actually now going to uh, elections. I think uh, next week, uh, General the Fourth, that that will be happening, right? So we wonder: Does also the, the choice of a leader also affect the business realignment within a community? Let's hear from Patrick uh, uh, briefly. Does the a given leadership in a country, like now we have a new leader uh, come August the 9th, also affect the integration or the business realignment within the East African community. Because we've seen also the Tan Kenya and Tanzania, we've not been having a very good uh, relationship so far, a very frosty one uh, over the last five years. I think the regional economic um, communities, as, uh, as they are, whether here or elsewhere, will always get a little bit of a shock when a new leader comes in. They'll come in with different policies and principles and try and, 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 and align that. And they may even say, I'm not going to participate for now until I understand really what is going on. But I, I think we have faith in the institutions that exist rather than the individual leaders. They can do a lot in terms of derailing what has already been done. But fundamentally, the business communities within the East African region will fight back. They will eventually find a way of saying, listen, what you've done has created this harm. And that harm is affecting not only us as business, but also the people of the country. And if you look at the recent tiff between Kenya and Tanzania, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It happened, pop, and it's gone down, yes. right? Yes. Because there's a very quick realization that that really wasn't helping both countries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We have what are called non-tariff barriers that keep coming up. And that is a reflection, really, of the political um, color in each of the countries every time. And those non-tariff barriers are being logged all the time. Yes. And those and, 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 and they will happen. They keep happening all the time. And I think the good thing is that there is a mechanism for resolving them. So I think even with the leadership changes that are going to happen within East Africa over time, I think the dream of the East African community coming together as a co completely free trade area yes. is going to continue mm -hmm. at different speeds, accelerate, slow down, accelerate, whatever it is. But all the time we are going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Pimal? I think, I think it's very clear. East African community is not reversible. Whether there's change of leadership in any country or not, it's not <coughs> reversible. The protocol is there, the agreements are there. So if there is any trade barrier, and I, like Patrick said, these are short-term barriers, or I call them speed bumps, yes. that affect us right now. These are created as non-tariff barriers by various governments or various leaders who change, right? Mm -hmm. And that does affect us in the short term. But in the long run, you can test this by going to court, the East African Court of Justice. You can test it by going to many avenues, and that's not stoppable. Yes. So East African community and a market as one, which is Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan, as one is going to get bigger and better. You can't stop it. Number two. Any government coming in tomorrow cannot come and say, I will now in, go inward looking towards only Kenya and I will re leave the rest aside. You will not be able to be attractive as an investment destination. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to be attractive as even employment creation. And I think this is where each country has its own comparative <coughs> advantage and competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, East Africa is so well set to serve the rest of Africa, right? That really it's an amazing opportunity. And I think everybody in their manifesto is talking about East Africa as a bigger, better market. 
yes, we do have speed bumps. Yes, we do have, you know, uh, Tanzania has been slowing down. But frankly, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda has already accepted that we need to move forward very fast. And therefore, if three of them are ready, I think the new protocol now should be, if three or four are ready, go ahead with it, get things done, even with the airports or whatever, and the rest will follow. I don't think anybody can back out of East Africa. We won't have a, a Brexit type of Brexit, situation yeah. in ESC. In fact, all the more, we might even be able to bring other countries mm -hmm. on board. We're actually trying to see if Ethiopia, Ethiopia can come on board, mm -hmm. but that's a long shot. However, we still think that East Africa is non-reversible. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. Thank you. All right, at this point, uh, we want to also hear you, say, and Usha, she is standing by. And I want to thank Vimal Shah and also Patrick Bath for their sentiment this morning here in the market. We'll continue past the conversation with Dr. Chris Kirubi. But for now, let's have you say. Right, it seems you have a lot to say on the different issues that we have been talking about today. So um, let's get straight to it. Uh, we have Ambani who says development is good, but everyone needs food. The next move is to focus on agribusiness. We also have um, Benal who says um, highly supported. We need to elect leaders with sound economic development, <coughs> clean records. <coughs> I beg your pardon. <coughs> clean record to eliminate culture of corruption corruption. We also have Mahesh who says, I agree with CK. It's not always mm. about national government, but more so on county level, accountability to be de delivered in county government. We also have Benel who says, um, IBC Kenya needs to up their game. They should make both sides have confidence in the process by not leaning towards one side. We have um, Mahesh who says, accountability, integrity and honesty, vices required in leadership, but we are lacking this in our leaders. We also have um, Abi who says the Kenyan economy is dwindling because our people find Western products more enticing and forget to support local markets. We have John who says politicians hold this country hostage every election year. Now again, fear, uncertainty, and evil foreboding are visible everywhere. We have um, Omaset, who says, speak to the triggers of violence, that is, bungled elections. Ask IEBC to do their jobs and all will be well. Um, we also have uh, Benel, who says, I fully agree. We need those who can make sure all taxes are collected and used, uh, not hashtag munataka nifanye nini jameni. We also have Samuel who says, uh, leaders are the pillars of peace, but when you're using hate languages in campaigns, you become an advocate of hatred. We also have John Gidanga who says, signing a peace pledge is not a big deal. Honoring the pledge is the problem. Politicians cannot be trusted. They are fickle. Of course, uh, Vimal had mentioned the um, peace pledge uh, and the fact that all the leaders have signed it. Unfortunately, he has already left the panel, so I think I might have to throw this to you, Chris. Um, do you think <coughs> that it might be a bit too simplistic to say that simply because the leaders signed the peace pledge, there is going to be peace? Because after all, um, I mean, uh, it's, it's a very fine line. For example, if you feel, if one party feels like they've lost the elections, then where is the, the, dis the distinction between fighting for for perhaps um, a, a retelling of the or the votes or or you know just just deciding to let it go because elections because you don't want people to fight at the same time you feel that you won fair and square and that the other party should concede defeat then how how then do you decide between um, trying to be fair and trying to put your foot down and deciding that you actually did win do you think it's a bit simplistic to say um, that there won't be any problems because the leaders signed the peace pledge? Uh, shall I repeat the question? You just kind of repeat it for Chris to... Right, so uh, John Gidanga says signing a peace pledge is not a big deal. Honoring the pledge is the problem. Politicians cannot be trusted. Uh, they are fickle. So uh, do you agree with him? I mean, signing the peace pledge is very simple. Do you, do you feel yes. that it's a bit simplistic to say simply because people signed the peace pledge, because the leaders signed the peace pledge, that there will be peace? That's, that's, that's very true. That's very true. I, I, I think the only way to make sure these leaders uh, keep their pledge is to follow their history, what they have done in the past, and uh, then, then just track their, their performance. Uh, we, we, we just take a, a pledge on, the, on face value that I sign a peace pledge, I'm, uh, you know, but behind the scene, 
what are those following the, the leader doing? You know, they may not show the, on the face of it, but what are their followers doing? That, 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 that need to be, to be, to be the, the thing that we follow and then account for them. Because if I sign a peace pledge and uh, when you go to Nyeri to campaign, my, my, my followers are throwing stones and beating you up, is is my peace pledge uh, trickling down to my followers? Am I telling my followers what to do? I, I, I think it should be a religion you sign for and your followers uh, pledge and, and and follow the same. So it need to tick, trickle down to your to your to your followers. And this is what those who make people sign a peace pledge is just a, a show of peace. It's not. Uh, something that is entrenched in the, in, in the organization, which is the party. I, I think it should be a party pledge that they will do things according to the pledge they sign for. Yeah. Right, so following up the pledge with action indeed. Um, and finally, we have uh, Njuhiga who says, uh, sitting president and governors need to be subjected to different forum where they account for their five years in power, not a hyped debate, right? So those are your um, comments and your outlook on, on what is happening in the country. Remember, hashtag AMLiveNTV, that is how you can get us on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram, and I would be happy to sample your comments using that hashtag. Back to you, Dibal. Many thanks indeed, Usha. At least today the monkeys are not on the line, huh? right. so uh, it's not really <laughs> acting up on you. Thank you for, for that. All right, we continue the conversation here with Dr. Chris Kirubi. Uh, Dr. Chris, first of all, I'd love you to weigh in on the East African, of course, integration and also choosing over leader uh, Vimal and uh, Patrick Obat also have weighed in on this. I want to hear your sentiments as well before we continue the conversation. I, I feel the community is part of us. East African community, the, the, the regional community, is really what will help us develop. So we need to make sure that uh, all the leaders in the region do adhere to what they promise, the policies, the community, because Kenya has sacrificed a lot mm -hmm. to make the community work. The, the, we, the, there were days we allowed the, the neighbors to import certain goods without any tariffs and we paid tariffs for five years it took us to 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 be able to bring them on board to to equal the partnership so we need tanzania to feel that uh, they are part of the community it's not a one-off affair mm -hmm. it is following the manifesto the commitment of the community yes. so that uh, we are all one you you don't belong to an organization which you actually hold the headquarter of that community. Mm -hmm. The East African community headquartered in Arusha. Yes. And therefore, if it's headquartered there, they should be the, more the leaders yeah, yeah, yeah. more, more in, uh, committed to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to what the community means. Mm -hmm. so, so when they say they allow certain things now to go, it's, it's, it's not on. It's, just follow the community rules. What are the rules of the game? You know, that common market. Mm -hmm. it, it should be adhered. It should be followed. It should be allowed to happen. We should not be burning their goods. And just That's not part of what the community is all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If everybody can, can adhere to what the community spirit is all about, we, we, it doesn't matter whether you like a leader in another country or you don't, that to me should be what is the religion, is the community policy and agreement that the leaders have agreed on, mm. that should be you are in or you are out of the community. Are they realizing yeah. this too late? Or is it uh, coming late in the day? Or is it because now as we're heading towards the general election, is when now they're trying to mend the fences, right? They're realizing this is not really working also for, for us in terms of business uh, environment. We're losing, uh, we need to cooperate more. So we have this diplomatic uh, rift that is being abridged right now. I, 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 I personally think we, 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 we should make our leaders commit to the community uh, ethos. Okay. Do they believe in what the community is all about, which they have signed as a country, not as a president? 
the community is is an agreement between countries it's not about the president the president should not interfere with what the community has has signed to mm -hmm. to, to abide by and uh, therefore it doesn't matter whether there is an election in Tanzania whether there is a leader who comes up whom we don't like that that is your own opinion mm -hmm. The, the, the main thing is that the leaders, the, 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 the population of in a country mm -hmm. elects their president. But the community agreements are based on the country's uh, policies that we have agreed that we are part of that common market. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, we must agree what is the common market, what are the rules, and have we agreed to those rules? If we break the rules, mm -hmm. they should be taken to the court mm -hmm. of the community to, 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 to be penalized mm -hmm. by not following the rules of the community. I, I, I think there is something here that, that does not seem to work. That uh, We have a community, but we are also dealing with individuals, uh, mm -hmm. presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that is wrong. And so it's so very hard to actually uncouple that, the, the, the president and the yeah. community. Our agreement uh, is uh, not with the president. It's not with the, no, not with the Makufuli. It's with the, with the community, which is Tanzania being part of the community. And the headquarters, quartering our head office of the community. Yeah, right. it's the policy of it's the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are we following the community rules and, uh, of, of the game? This, this to me should be what we, we go for. Right. Uh, Dr. Kirubi, I'll be remiss also if you don't actually uh, also hear your opinion on what uh, the pronouncement from IBC regarding the periodic you know, announcement of the presidential results, that we wait for that one big announcement. What do you think, as maybe from a businessman perspective, also, this will really portend for the country? I, you think that you know, we we have given IBC the the role, which is given to them by the constitution, that they are the only ones who are responsible for announcing results of the of of, 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 of the elections. And therefore, I think there's something wrong when you say in a county or in a region where they make announcements, those people determine what are the numbers, who are the winners. The, the IBC is just trying to create a law and order by saying we have to receive these results, we have to edit them, look at them, and our pronouncement is the final for anybody to follow. So if I go to an area where I am the majority party and announce the wrong results to comply with my people demand outside the, the, there in the county, is it the real results? No, I have to check with the members who are registered to vote in that county mm -hmm. against my the results which are, have been received mm -hmm. have they been signed by all the parties by the by the way there is something we are not saying are these results being announced have been verified and signed by all the observers of each of the parties mm -hmm. in, an, in, 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 a, in, a, in a in a polling station. It's only after they've been signed and agreed by all those who are there to represent every party, have they agreed that this, these results are real. Am I announcing results that are beyond the registered members to vote in that area. All right, but but this is yes, we understand. This is the yeah. limit of the IBC. Yeah. No, one, no one is really going against that. But the 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 one pronouncement that they're going to make, which is one and final, of course. But we don't have any periodic announcement in between. 
you know, we get these uh, results from these particular counties and this, you know, maybe they give us an update of what is happening. So everyone in Kenyan is just sit, sitting, you know, feed, uh, twiddling the thumbs, waiting for that, that big an announcement. Don't you think that one also will cause maybe uh, uh, or heighten tension in the country? I, 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 I don't think so. I, I, I think the constitution gives the IBC the, the power to verify the results they give them the the timelines you remember the, the the opposition went to cut that time by half yes and the court said no you cannot it's really to create a very viable result so that when they are announced we all agree they are real they are results that you can go and interrogate and, and I think, is it 14 hours? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, are, should, they should be allowed to verify that every result from the county, because this is not a governor's resu results, because the governor is elected by a small community in a small area. You can very quickly uh, verify the, those results and announce them. The presidential results is a national result mm -hmm. from the whole country. Would you like results announced which do not match the actual thing in a county? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think people should, be, should, be, should understand the importance of those results. They must be patient to allow the, the IBC to scrutinize that everything has been done has been signed by everybody in the county you know a member who represents a small party is as important mm -hmm. as the member who represents the biggest party in a county thank where you. the results are being announced thank you so we don't want results which are going to be challenged and say you announce this but the real thing is this you you will create chaos thank you yeah. all right a good point uh yeah to end with and i thank you very much for your valued company this morning yeah dr chris kirubi entrepreneur industrialist and philanthropist we've been discussing of course what thriving business and peace a peaceful country which is a very very important even as we're getting up towards a general election two weeks right from now